Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Chem 104. We're starting Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is a very big chapter. We're talking about ionic and molecular compounds. Because it's such a big chapter, I'm going to split it into two parts. Make sure you watch both. If Chapter 4, where we talked about um, electron configurations and things like that, if that was a little bit fuzzy, if it didn't hit right with you, still feel a little bit confused, you may want to go back and make sure you understand those concepts before you start chapter 6. Also, if you will be taking Chem 105 in the future, chapter 6 is a very important chapter because this is kind of like the jumping off point for Chem 105. If you don't have this basis, then Chem 105 will start off being very difficult for you. Make sure you understand it. With that said, Let's go for it. If you're interested in being a, f a pharmacist or a nurse, a doctor, anyone who deals with medication, prescribing medication, preparing medication, you really need to understand ionic and molecular compounds. The first section covers ions and how transfer of electrons works. We're going to learn how to write symbols for simple ions, and we're just going to focus on the representative elements for the most part. Now, there's two different types of bonds. We're going to cover ionic bonds pretty much in this section, but we'll be talking about covalent bonds later on. So let's define them both. Ionic bonds occur when valence electrons of a metal atom are transferred to the atom of a nonmetal. Remember that valence electrons are the outermost electrons. So if you have an electron configuration, let's say the abbreviated configuration, where you have a noble gas core and then some S and P electrons, those S and P electrons outside of the noble gas core are the valence electrons those electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. A covalent bond occurs when nonmetal atoms share electrons and they attain a noble gas arrangement. There's no transfer, they're sharing. This is kind of what it looks like if you could see these uh, bonds forming. You have a metal that's got valence electron. It's going to transfer that electron to the nonmetal. And what you have left is a positively charged metal and a negatively charged nonmetal. That's an ionic bond. If you have two nonmetals, that each have some number of valence electrons. They will share electrons so that they each have a full octet. They look like the nearest noble gas. Let's focus on ions. We'll start with positive ions. To form a positive ion, you have to lose some electrons. When a metal loses its valence electrons, it forms a positive ion. The metals that we'll be concerned with, primarily for this section, are in group 1A, 2A, and 3A. These metals have low ionization energies. That means that they lose their electrons pretty easily and they'll form an ion with a positive charge. They'll lose electrons until they have the same number of valence electrons as the nearest noble gas, which usually means eight valence electrons. A positively charged ion is called a cation. And to name a positively charged ion, you simply call it by its element name. So that was a lot, kind of abstract. 
but let's put this to a specific example. Let's say that I have a sodium atom. I've got each of the sublevels here, not worrying about the orbitals and the shapes. We're just saying sublevel one, two, and three. These are the energy levels, right? In the first energy level, I've got two electrons based on my configuration down here. In the second level, I've got eight. It's the 2s plus the 2p. In the 3s, which is the third energy level, I've only got one. If I were to label the valence electron, it'd be this one that's out in the 3s. It's the outermost electron, right? If I were to write this in the abbreviated electron configuration, it would be neon and then 3s1. We should also talk about the nucleus of this atom. The nucleus has 11 protons. Surrounding that nucleus, we have 11 electrons. That's sodium. When it loses that one valence electron, we now have 10 electrons. We didn't do anything to the protons. We've still got 11 protons. That means we've got one more positively charged particle than we do in negatively charged particles. So we have a positive charge. When we lose the valence electron, we're losing that 3s1 electron. So the configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's a total of 10 electrons. Two in the first energy level. Eight in the second energy level. If we were to write the abbreviated configuration, it would just look like neon, which itself has 10 electrons. This is what happens when a metal forms an ion. It loses its valence electrons and it becomes positively charged because the number of protons stays the same in the nucleus. But the number of electrons is different. So keep that idea in the back of your mind as you're going through and identifying these metals and their different valence electrons and what ions they form. This is what's happening. They're losing that outer electron and becoming something that resembles a noble gas. Let's talk about the negative ions. Negative ions are formed by nonmetals. We're talking about groups 5A, 6A, and 7A. These guys have high ionization energies. They don't want to give up their electrons. And to make them do so, it's going to be a big fight. Instead, what they'd rather do is gain more electrons. And that's what they do to form an ion. They'll gain one or more valence electrons and form an ion with a negative charge. That's called an anion. 
they'll gain electrons until they have the same number of valence electrons as the nearest noble gas, which again is usually eight valence electrons. If we were to name an anion, you use the first syllable of its name followed by IDE. Let's put this to a specific example. Chlorine. Chlorine is in group 7A, so it is absolutely a nonmetal. It's a halogen. The electron configuration, the full one, is written here. Let's put in where our electrons are. And again, these are the energy levels, the main energy levels. I'm not drawing any orbitals or anything like that. I'm not that good of an artist. We've got two electrons in the first energy level. Eight electrons in the second. And seven electrons in the third. Let's talk about what happens when chlorine decides to form an ion. Chlorine is looking to gain one more electron. How do we know this? Well, it has seven valence electrons. And we can represent that using a Lewis symbol. There's one more slot available for an electron. One vacancy, if you will. So it's going to take that electron from a willing metal And it's going to complete that third energy level. Still have the same number of electrons in the first and second energy levels. But now, instead of seven electrons in the third energy level, we have eight. So our ion has gained an electron. That's how it became an ion. If we wanted to write this in noble gas configuration, what you would do is look at where chlorine is on the periodic table and look at the noble gas that is in the same row. So you'd go over one more space to the row where the, the excuse me, the column, the group where the noble gases are. And you'd see that it looks like argon. So it has achieved happiness by becoming something that looks like argon. All it had to do was gain one more electron. We didn't do anything with the proton. So let's look, let's look back at the chlorine atom. The atom, if we're looking at a periodic table, we can figure out how many protons and electrons a neutral atom of chlorine has. The atomic number is 17, so it has 17 protons. 
neutral atom means that you have the same number of protons as you do electrons. So that's 17 too. We didn't do anything to the protons. So there's still 17 there. And that's what makes chlorine chlorine. So it stays the same. But we gained one valence electron. So we increase the number of electrons. If we were to name this ion, start with the name of the element, that's chlorine. You only need the first syllable of chlorine. So we cross out everything that comes after that first syllable replace it with IDE. That becomes chloride. And it's the same rule for all of the nonmetals. This table has formulas and names of common ions. You've got the metals on the left, the nonmetals on the right. This will help you tremendously when you're writing formulas and naming compounds. We can use the group numbers on the periodic table to determine the charges for the ions of the representative elements. Metals form cations. Their charge, and again this is for the representative elements, is equal to their group number. But it has to be the one with the A behind it. So group 1A has a charge of 1 plus. Nonmetals form anions. For them, the charge is equal to the group number, again the one that has the A behind it, minus 8. So if you're oxygen, you're in group 6A. 6 minus 8 gives you negative 2. That's the charge of the oxide ion. Ions are really important in the body. Sodium and potassium are key for regulating body, body fluids and cellular functions. You can find these in salt, cheese, pickles, that's for sodium. Potassium, everyone says bananas, 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 which yeah, they have potassium, but potatoes have a lot of potassium, more than bananas. So somebody's trying to get people to buy bananas. Orange juice, milk, those are other places where you can get um, a good amount of potassium. Calcium and magnesium are also very important. We know about calcium and bones, right? Milk does a body good. It's got calcium for your bones, right? Maybe they don't use that slogan anymore. But when I was a kid, somebody in the milk lobby was just trying to push milk on everybody. Drink milk. Drink milk. Please drink milk so we can make money. Okay. Milk is great. My kids drink it. But come on, guys. Stop with the commercials. Other sources of calcium include cheese, which has milk in it, right? Greens, so leafy greens, spinach. Magnesium is important as well. And it's important in a lot of places for enzymes to function, which enzymes are just proteins that do chemistry. Muscles, nerve control, 
magnesium is important for the structure of your DNA in your cells. So the blueprint of how to make you and sustain you. And you can find that in chlorophyll, nuts, grains. So ions are very important. They have a huge role in maintaining homeostasis or just the regular overall functions of being you. Let's do a quick learning check. We need to write the formula and symbol of an ion with 16 protons and 18 electrons. To write a symbol, we need to know what element it is. The clue to which element we're looking at is in the number of protons. That's the atomic number. You look up the element that has 16 for its atomic number, and you'll find that it's sulfur, and the symbol for sulfur is an S. We know that it has 16 protons and 18 electrons. We can do that math to figure out what the charge is. These are our protons. These are our electrons. It looks like we've got two more electrons than we do protons. So that is going to be our symbol for our ion, and it's a 2 minus. Let's take it one step further and name this. This is sulfur. To name an anion, which this is, we just need the first syllable, so that's sulf. You replace all that other stuff at the end with IDE. This is the sulfide ion. Again, the key to this problem is knowing how to figure out the symbol. The number of protons tells you the identity of the element, always and forever. Let's do another question. I'd encourage you to pause on this one and work it through yourself. Then rejoin me and see how you did. We're going to consider calcium. Identify the element as a metal or a nonmetal. If you find it on the periodic table, you'll see it's a group 2A element. The group 2 elements are the alkaline earth metals. So this is a metal. The number of valence electrons, this is part B, is equal to the group number. It's in group 2A. It has two valence electrons. State the number of electrons that must be lost or gained to acquire an octet. Since we're dealing with a metal, Metals lose electrons to become ions. When you become an ion, you've acquired an octet. You've got that happy outer shell that's full. No more vacancies. To accomplish this, a metal must lose all of its valence electrons. So it must lose two electrons to acquire an octet. Write the symbol, including its ionic charge and name of the resulting ion. Calcium would be two plus, and we'd call the ion calcium. You need to be able to do this for any of the representative elements on the periodic table. If you can do this, 
then you're in very good shape for the beginning of chapter six. We laid the foundation of ions. Let's put it together, the cations and the anions, to form formulas and name compounds. Ionic compounds are made of positive and negative ions. And let's use our vocabulary words, cations and anions. They have attractions called ionic bonds between those charged ions. And we covered what an ionic bond was in the first section of chapter six. Ionic compounds have really high melting points and they're solids at room temperature. Sodium chloride is something that we use a lot as an example because it's so relatable. Sodium chloride is also known as table salt. If you could use your eye to look at the crystals of salt in your little bottle of Morton's on your spice shelf, you would see the sodium ions and the chloride ions arranged in this crystal lattice form. They'd be partaking in an ionic bond. That's how you make those crystal lattices. In a chemical formula, the symbols and the subscripts are written in the lowest whole number ratio of atoms or ions. The sum of the ionic charges is always equal to zero. That means the total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge. Let's look at that sodium chloride example. We're starting with a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. Sodium is in group 1A. So it's got one valence electron. And that's what's shown in this Lewis dot structure, one valence electron. Chlorine is a nonmetal in group 7A. It's got seven valence electrons. Because it's a nonmetal, it's looking to gain electrons. Sodium says, hey, I got an electron here. You want it? And chlorine is like, yeah, I'll take it. So sodium transfers its electron to the chlorine. And now we've got a positively charged sodium ion and a negatively charged chloride ion. The charge on the sodium ion is plus one. And in this formula, there's only one sodium ion. So that's what this one is. There's one sodium ion. There's also one chloride ion. And you multiply that by its charge of negative one. If we want it to have the total charge of the compound, you take the positive one from the sodium ion, you add that to the negative one of the chloride ion, and you get zero. For any ionic compound, you should get zero. And we can do this analysis for any ionic compound. Let's do another one that's a little bit more complex. This time we're starting with magnesium. Magnesium is in group 2A. So it's got two valence electrons. We still have chlorine, which is still in group 7A, and it has seven valence electrons. Now, I like to think about these things as a story. To me, it helps, helps you retain it a little bit better. So if it's a little silly to you, I apologize. But if it helps you, you're welcome. Let's say magnesium called up chlorine and said, hey, I've got an offer that you cannot refuse. 
two electrons here. You want them? The chlorine's like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm all about electrons, but I've only got space for one. Got seven valence electrons? Can only fit one. Can I'll, I'll, I'll take one. And magnesium's like, look, both of these electrons got to move. I move them both or I moves none. And chlorine's like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I want it. I want it. Just give me a minute. Can I have a day? Just, just give me a day. I'll find someone else to take another electron. So he calls up another buddy and says, look, I got a magnesium on the phone. He got two electrons. I got a day. You want one because I need one. I, he, he only going to give me one if he can get rid of both of them. You with me? And the other one's like, well, I don't get paid until Friday. And Chlor look, look, man, I got you. Just, just get me when you get paid. You taking this electron or no? And he's like, all right, cool. All that to say that magnesium wants to get rid of both of its valence electrons. Chlorine only has space for one. So instead of just one chlorine atom, we have two chlorine atoms. And both of them receive an electron from magnesium. When we have our molecular, or excuse me, our ionic formula, we've got one magnesium ion and its charge is two plus, and we have two chloride ions. Each of those have a charge of negative one. So we're looking at a positive two from the one magnesium ion and a total of negative two from the chloride ions together. That gives us zero for the overall charge of the compound. To balance the ionic charge when we're writing formulas, we have to make sure that that total positive charge equals the total negative charge. I know I've said it a million times, but when you're actually doing it, it's one of those things that's very easy to forget. Let's write the ionic formula for a compound formed with Ba2 plus and Cl minus ions. Ba2 plus, that comes from barium. So let's say we had a barium atom. And it was in the neighborhood of chlorine. Those circles should be the same size. By now you should know, I ain't the best artist, but I'm a great storyteller. Barium wants to give away two electrons. It's in group 2A. It's going to give one to one chlorine atom and the other to another chlorine atom. That results in barium 2 plus forming. And then we also have chloride ions forming. We've got one barium and two chloride ions 
That's what the 2 is. This is our ionic formula. It's got one barium and two chlorides. Let's do our little analysis. If we've got one barium atom and it's got a positive two charge, and then we've got two chloride ions, that's like saying 2 minus 2, which is equal to 0. So our formula is correct. Let's take that information and move forward to naming and writing ionic formulas. We always use salt as an example, but iodized salt, which is what that bottle of Morton's is, contains potassium iodide, and that prevents iodine deficiency. Before we can just run off to the races and start writing these formulas, we need to address the other metals on the periodic table. A lot of the metals on the periodic table can form more than one positive ion. Specifically, we're talking about the transition metals. So we're really looking at the D block, if you remember from chapter four. All of those metals, for the most part, can form two or more positive ions. There are some exceptions though, and you'll need to know these. Zinc, cadmium, and silver only form one ion. So zinc 2 plus, cadmium 2 plus, and silver plus, okay? Everything else you can assume that it can form at least two cations. To differentiate between the two different charge states, you can use a Roman numeral equal to the ion charge in parentheses, and you place that directly after the metal name. So if you have copper, you can have copper 2 plus or 1 plus. The way you'd write that out in the name is to have the Roman numeral 2 in parentheses or the Roman numeral 1 in parentheses after the word copper. Now to help you out, because you may not know your Roman numerals, I'll give you up to 6. There's your Roman numerals. Remember, you don't need to use a Roman numeral for the exceptions. So the zinc 2 plus, when you're writing the name of that ion, it's simply zinc. Same thing for cadmium 2 plus and silver plus. When you're naming an ionic compound, the first part of that name is the metal. And that's just the same as the element. If that metal is a transition metal, you need to include that charge. So don't forget that Roman numeral. The second part of the name is for the non-metal. And you write that as the, the first syllable of the non-metal name plus IDE. There's a space between those two words, the metal and the non-metal. Let's do some practice. We have an ionic compound here. 
K2O. First thing we do is identify what metal this is. It's potassium. Then you ask yourself, is this a transition metal, which I abbreviate TM, or NA? Nah? In this case, it's NA. Nah. Potassium is in group 1A, regular old representative element, so we don't need to use a Roman numeral. Now we can move on to the second element. That's the non-metal, so it's going to form our anion. We take the first syllable of that element name. That's oxygen. We want ox. And then add IDE. And I'll show you, just as a reminder, Oxygen is the whole name. We get rid of that. IDE. That's how we get to oxide. So the name of this compound is potassium oxide. Let's do one with a variable charge. We have to figure out the charge on the anion first and then use charge balance to calculate the charge on the metal. So I told you this is a variable charge one, but you won't necessarily know that off rip. It's not going to say that on your homework or in your exam. So always ask yourself the first question, transition metal or gnaw? In this case, the answer is yes. Transition metal. Then you have to ask yourself, is this an exception? Remember that zinc, cadmium, and silver all form only one ion. So if it's a transition metal, but it's one of those, we don't need to use a Roman numeral. In this case, we've got manganese. So the answer is no. We have to use a Roman numeral for the charge. But we don't know what that charge is yet. So let's focus on the anion. Our anion is fluorine. It's in group 7A. To figure out the charge, we take the group number, which is 7, subtract 8, and that gives us negative 1 for the charge. I know that I've got one manganese ion. And that manganese ion has a charge. I've got two fluoride ions, and they each have a negative one charge. When I add those charges together, I have to get zero. So our manganese has to be plus two. Now we can write the name of that cation. Manganese, which is the name of the element, followed by a two in parentheses. And then we already, I already let the cat out of the bag for the name for this anion. You take fluorine, 
get rid of everything after the first syllable, replace it with IDE. Manganese 2 fluoride. Without that Roman numeral, we'd be lost because manganese can form multiple cations. Let's do another one. I'd suggest that you pause it here and try it for yourself. Then you can rejoin me and see how you're doing. We've got to name this compound. I recognize this. This is iron. I look at the periodic table. It's a transition metal. It's not an exception, so I have to use a Roman numeral. I'll put that on the back burner for now. I'll turn my attention to the anion, chlorine. It's in group 7A. Remember when you're finding the charge of an anion, you're taking the group number that ends that has the A after it and subtracting 8. Very similar to fluorine because they're both in the same group. So its charge is negative 1. In my compound, I know that I have one of my iron ions and I've got two of my chloride ions that have a charge of negative one. And all of that has to equal zero. So my iron must be two plus. Now I can write the whole name. Iron with a two in parentheses we take chlorine, take the chlor, replace everything else with IDE. The name of this compound is iron 2 chloride. This table has metals with variable charge. So you can always reference it and make sure that you're not making something up like copper 10 plus and like, oh, that doesn't seem right. So this will be a good thing for you. I want to draw your attention, though, to one weird one. Mercury. Mercury is already strange because it's a metal that's liquid at ambient temperatures. So already a little bit strange. But even stranger, the mercury ion that has a plus one charge doesn't like to hang out on its own. So I'll write it out here. Mercury 1 likes to hang out in pairs. So you'll see it Hg2, 2 plus, not Hg plus. Mercury 1 is very social. It likes to have a buddy with it. So when you see that or you recognize, oh, the charge is 1 plus for mercury, Remember that it's written HG2, 2 plus. Here are some ionic compounds and their names. So the metal ion is named, the non-metal ion is named, and the whole compound is named. This will give you some reference to kind of 
what the pattern is. If you're just a pattern finder, this table will help you with naming. Another very helpful table is some common ion charges. No, you can't have this on the exam, but yes, you can use it for your homework. It will definitely help you when you're writing formulas and when you're writing names. We've taken the chemical formula and written the name. Now we have to go in reverse. Take the name and write the formula. The formula for an ionic compound has the metal first and then the nonmetal. Pretty easy, right? But we have to add subscripts to make sure that the balance to balance the charge. We may not always have to do that, but it's something we have to look out for. Let's write the formula for iron 3 chloride. I like to split this up. We'll deal with the iron 3, that's our cation. Then we'll deal with the chloride, which is the anion. Iron 3 tells you what its ionic charge is. The symbol for iron is Fe. The Roman numeral 3 tells us the charge is 3 plus. The chloride tells us the identity of the element. Chlor comes from chlorine and its symbol is Cl. It's a group 7A element and we can calculate the charge. The charge is equal to the group number minus 8 which gives you negative 1. If I were to take one ion of the iron 3 plus and add that charge to one ion of the chlorine, the chloride ion, I would get something that is definitely not zero. So we need to use some subscripts here because we need multiples of something somewhere. What you can do is do a little swapping. You take the charge on the cation and use that as the subscript for the anion in your formula. You do the same thing with the anion, but in this case, it's one, right? We don't write one, not in the formula. It's implied, if you see the symbol, you have one of those ions. Now let's do our check. We've still got one iron three plus, which would be one times a positive three. And now we've got three chloride ions. So that's three times negative one, and that gives us zero. So FeCl3 is our formula for iron three chloride. Now we'll talk about polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are just groups of atoms that have a collective charge. These can be 
a part of ionic compounds as well. And we'll learn how to name and write formulas with these polyatomic ions. So like I said, these atoms are covalently bonded. They have an overall ionic charge. So think of them as one unit. They often have nonmetals like phosphorus or sulfur or nitrogen bonded to oxygen atoms. And their charges are usually negative one, two, or three. There is an exception. As always, there's an exception. NH4 plus, that's ammonium. It has a positive charge. All the other polyatomic ions are negatively charged. There are lots of products that contain polyatomic ions. Fertilizer, for one. Plaster casts. So they're everywhere. Need to recognize them. This table has all of the names and the formulas of the polyatomic ions. These are the common ones. This is definitely something you want in your notebook. Let's talk about some of these. There are lots of polyatomic ions that end in ATE. We've got sulfate, phosphate, nitrate. If there's a related ion that has one less oxygen, then its name will end in ITE. We've got four oxygens in sulfate. There are three oxygens in sulfite. Phosphate, we've got four oxygens. Phosphite, three. Nitrate, we have three oxygens. Nitrite, there are two. Ite has one less oxygen. There are some exceptions, as usual. Cyanide and hydroxide, they end in IDE. That's not an eight or eight, but they are polyatomic ions. You can add a hydrogen to the polyatomic ion, and that's just adding plus one to its charge. So if you take the carbonate ion, CO3 two minus, and you add a hydrogen to it, it goes from being two minus to one minus. And the name of that is bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. With sulfate, that ion starts as two minus. If you add a hydrogen, you now have one minus. You can do that with any of the polyatomic ions. The halogens, and that we're talking about group 7A, They form four polyatomic ions with oxygen, and they all have a negative one charge. The one with the most oxygens has per, and then the first syllable, then eight. You take away one oxygen, and you've just got the eight. So most oxygens at the top, minus one oxygen from the per eight form. You take away another oxygen and you've got the eight form. So that's minus two oxygens 
from the most oxygens that you can have. And if you take away another oxygen, that's the hypoite. The example we have is perchlorate. That's got four oxygens. Chlorate has one less oxygen than that, so it's got three. Chlorite has two fewer oxygens than the perchlorate and one fewer than the chlorate, so it's got two. Hypochlorite has three fewer oxygens than the perchlorate. It has one fewer oxygen than the ite form. So the difference between levels is one oxygen. And again, this is for all of the halogens in group 7a. We can write formulas that contain polyatomic ions. We use the same rules for charge balance that we did with the simple ionic compounds. Let's talk about magnesium nitrate. Anytime you see something that ends in ITE, just kind of assume that you're dealing with a polyatomic ion. Magnesium, we recognize that it's a group 2A metal. That means that it's going to lose two valence electrons and that its charge is equal to the group number. So that is our magnesium ion. Nitrate, like I said, has that ATE. So you should be thinking to yourself, that's a polyatomic ion. You look that up on your chart and you get NO3 minus. If I were to take one of each of these, I'd have one times the charge of the magnesium ion, which is a positive two, and I'd add to that one times a negative one because I have one nitrate ion and its charge is minus one. If I did that, I get something that's not zero. So I have to use subscripts. We can do the same trick as we did before. But we need to make sure the polyatomic ion is in parentheses. That way, when we go to multiply that ion by a certain number to have more than one nitrate ion, we're multiplying the whole thing. You take that 2 in the charge of the magnesium, which is the cation, You drop it down as the subscript for the anion. In this case, we've got a polyatomic anion that is in parentheses. Nitrate has a charge of minus one. We don't write one as a subscript, so we should be done here. But let's double check. I've got one magnesium ion which has a charge of positive two. I've got two nitrate ions and they each have a charge of negative one. That gives me a zero for my overall charge. So I know my formula is correct.
Let's try a real different one this time. We've got aluminum bicarbonate. That ATE clues you in that you're dealing with some kind of a polyatomic ion. Aluminum is a group 3A metal. So its charge is equal to the group number, which is 3. Bicarbonate. That's taking one of our polyatomic ions and adding a hydrogen. If I had one aluminum ion and one bicarbonate, I'd get something that is not zero. Have to use subscripts here. And the reason why I go through the trouble of this first step is because sometimes the charges are equal. And if they're equal, you're done. If they're not equal, you have a little bit more work to do. Always put that polyatomic ion in parentheses. If you need to have more than one, it needs to be in parentheses. Take the three and the charge of the aluminum, drop it down as the subscript. Bicarbonate has a negative one charge. We don't need to write a one for the subscript. That's already implied. We have one aluminum ion and three bicarbonates. They each have a charge of negative one. And that gives us an overall charge of zero. That is our formula. Let's do one more. If you haven't already tried pausing it and writing it out, I'd suggest you do. Make sure though that you have that chart with the polyatomic ions so you can recognize them and write the proper formula for them. Sodium. That's in group 1A. The charge is equal to the group number, which is one. That's our ion. Phosphate. It's a polyatomic ion. Look it up on the chart. Let me write that a little bit further down. We get that from the chart. If I had one sodium ion and one phosphate ion, I'd get something that's very much not zero. I've got to use subscripts here.
this time, the only one that has a number as part of its charge that we would write as a subscript is the phosphate ion. So we'll drop that down as the subscript for the cation, which is sodium. We don't need to write the one for the phosphate ion. And since there's only one, we don't need parentheses. Let's do our check. This time we have three of our cation. That's the sodium plus. We've got one phosphate ion and its charge is negative three. Those two things together give us zero charge. There's our chemical formula. We went from the name to the formula. Now we have to name the formulas. It's very simple and it's very similar to the naming we were doing before. You write the positive ion first. You write the polyatomic ion second. Use that chart. There's no prefixes or anything else. You just have to name what you see. So let's name a couple. I'll do the first one and then I'd encourage you to try naming the second one. This first one, our metal is calcium. It's not a transition metal, so we don't have to worry about a Roman numeral for its charge. The polyatomic ion is NO3. That's nitrate. That's it. Calcium nitrate. Done. The second one, a little bit trickier. We're starting with iron. Iron absolutely is a transition metal and it is not an exception. So we need to know what our charge is. We know the name of the ion that it's paired with. That's phosphate. So we just need to fill in the charge here. I've got one iron atom and I've got one phosphate atom. The charge on that phosphate is three minus. And I know that this has to equal zero. So my iron must have a charge of positive three. The name of our compound is iron three phosphate. Don't forget about checking to see if that metal is one of the ones that has a variable charge. This table has some compounds, ionic compounds, that contain polyatomic ions. They also have medical uses. So antacids, antiperspirants, all the things. Take a look at this list, see how many things you recognize. As you get older, you might recognize Epsom salts. If you have a grandmother or grandfather or someone who's older, auntie, uncle, they may soak in them Epsom salts. And I'm gonna tell you something. Once you get past that stage of feeling like you're invincible because you're young and your body starts saying, hey, but I hurt though, 
you will find Epsom salts to be a friend. I'm not even going to lie. I ain't old, but I ain't young, young. And them, Eps- them Epsom salts, they hit right. I'm going to tell you that. Some days, you just need to soak. Just turns out that it's also a compound with the polyatomic ion. Chemistry is beautiful. This flow chart will help you with naming ionic compounds. So I'm not going to go through it, but if you're a flow chart type of person, if this will help you with learning the process of naming, go for it. As you can see, there's something missing from here because all we've talked about is ionic compounds. We've got to change that. Molecular compounds, they share electrons. We've got to learn how to name them. Molecular compounds form when you've got two or more nonmetals sharing electrons and forming a covalent bond. The valence electrons are shared among the atoms and that gives them stability. A molecule is a discrete group of atoms in a definite proportion. Definite proportion, what we're talking about is H2O. That's got two hydrogens and one oxygen. That is definite. If you change the number of hydrogens or the number of oxygens, you don't have water anymore. It's a different compound. When you're naming molecular compounds, you're going to first name the first nonmetal in the formula. Then you're going to take the second nonmetal, the first syllable, and follow that up by IDE. Very similar to naming the anions, the simple negative ions. When you have two or more atoms, you need to use a prefix. There are also cases where you need to use a prefix for one atom. I'll show you when we do that. With these compounds, you can have the same two nonmetals, but they're combined in different ratios. We've got CO2 versus CO. Still has carbon and oxygen, but the ratios are different. The way that we would name this first one, you write the name of the element, which is carbon. Then you use a prefix from the table. These are the Greek prefixes. And the one to show the number two is di. You need the first syllable of oxygen. That's ox, followed by I-D-E, carbon dioxide. Now you probably knew that one but you didn't know why it was called that. The second one starts off the same, it's carbon, but we've only got one oxygen and we have to use a prefix to show that we've only got one. That's what mono is for. When you have two vowels like O and O or A and O appearing next to each other, the first vowel is omitted. And we had that in the carbon monoxide, but I'll show you kind of how you get there. Let's name this next one. We've got nitrogen and there's only one oxygen. So you might be inclined to do that don't because it'll be wrong a spelling error but you know still wrong let's put our best foot forward only one o okay and likewise if you have an a and an o you get rid of the a so the first vowel that you encounter you get rid of it. 
This table has some names of common molecular compounds and some of their commercial uses. So carbon dioxide is actually in fire extinguishers. It's also dry ice. So when it is a solid, it's called dry ice. You carbonate beverages with it. We've got nitrogen oxide. It's a stabilizer and it is a biochemical messenger in cells. It's important for um, dilation of blood vessels. Sulfur dioxide, preserving fruits and vegetables, bleaching textiles. Weird that it's something that can bleach textiles and we also use it to preserve food, I know. Blows your mind when you learn about chemistry, some of the things that we use to eat and do crazy industrial processes. With that aside, let's do some more practice. Let's name this molecule. Molecule. We've got NCl3. Now that chart that had all the Greek prefixes, you'll need to know that one. So I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier, but put that in your notebook. You're watching this on YouTube, so you can always slide on back, and take a look at it and jot it down. Or if you are able to access Blackboard, go to the notes. Anyway, let's name this. We'll write down the name of the first element, which is nitrogen. I see a subscript here, so I need to use a prefix that describes that subscript. There are three of these chlorine atoms. We use tri. Chlorine is the element. I need the first syllable, chlor followed by IDE, nitrogen trichloride. Let's do another one. Pause it here and give it a try yourself, and then join me and see how you did. Now we have a subscript for the first and second elements. We need to use a prefix to describe how many of these boron atoms we have. For two we use di. Then you still write the whole element name. Di boron. Next we use a prefix to describe the three. That's tri. Followed by oxide. The ox is from the oxygen. And then the ide is added after that first syllable. Now we have to go in the reverse order. You're given the name and you have to write the molecular compound, the formula. You have to just dissect this piece by piece. Look for the element and the prefixes and that will tell you how many of each element you have. The first element that's named is the first element in the formula. So looking at our example, diphosphorus pentoxide, phosphorus is our first element. We write that down. This prefix is di. That means two. That's the subscript for phosphorus. We jump on over to the second word and we first identify what element we have. Ox comes from oxygen. Pent is from penta, which means five. So that's our subscript. P2O5 is the formula. We've learned about ionic and covalent compounds. We need to be able to identify which is which. A compound is usually ionic if the first element in the formula or the name is a metal or a polyatomic ion like ammonium. That's the only one that's positive. So if you see a metal or you see ammonia, it's probably ionic. 
you usually have a covalent compound on your hands if you're looking at all nonmetals. The first element is going to be a nonmetal versus a metal. This is the complete flow chart for naming compounds. You've got the ionic and the molecular. If you're a flow chart person, put it in your notebook. Use it when you're doing homework. Use it to practice. Here's some more practice for you. Again, I recommend pausing, trying it yourself, and then see how you do. With naming and writing formulas, it's really critical that you practice, practice, practice. That way, the rules will become second nature to you. Use the flow chart, get used to it, and let that become your logic when you're naming or writing formulas. The first one, SICL4. I know that the first one has to be silicon because that's the name of the element. And there's no subscript for it, so it can't be B. I've got four chlorine atoms because of this subscript. So it has to be C. P2O5. It's phosphorus, but there's two of them. So I have to have a prefix. Even if I don't know what the prefix is, I know there has to be one, so I can rule out A and B. That leaves me with C. Cl2O7. I've got subscripts on both of my elements. So C cannot be correct because that first element doesn't have a prefix. It can't be B either because the second element doesn't have a prefix. So I'm left with A. I talked it through that way just to remind you that with multiple choice questions, you don't always have to know what the answer is. And it's sometimes more helpful to know what the answer isn't. Rule those out first, especially if it's a question that you're a little bit shaky on the concept. Rule out the answers that you know for sure are not it. And that will help you do a lot better on multiple choice exams. That's it for this part. Again, that was only the first half of chapter six. Please watch the next video that's going to cover the remaining sections of chapter six. As always, come to live lecture. We do practice problems. I give you details about assignments and exams. You'll always be updated on when things are due, when exams are, all that kind of stuff. And you get feedback from me that will help you learn. So don't skip out on live lecture. If you can, arrange your work schedule so that you can make it to class. I promise it's worth it. Thanks again for watching and please be safe.